Hello and welcome to Parental Mentals. I'm Marcus. Hello, I'm Claire. And we are, well, it's only been, what, how long since our last episode? So long. Three years. years. Yeah, so <laughs> it's been a while. But I don't want to, should we not look back and compare what we look like? Uh, well, we, I have already because I wanted to see whether uh, or not it was worth doing it. Stressing. Again. Yeah, it was whether or not it was actually anything for us to do. But here we are, we're having another go at it. So if you uh, actually watched any of our previous episodes, welcome back. If you're new to us, then hello and welcome. We are um, Parental Mentals, as we said. So we are. what are we talking about today, Claire? Oh, I don't like my name, babe. Remember that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So what are we talking and about? And I've had to, you've made me do two things that really, that really upset me. So I've had to introduce myself. It's a demand that I really don't want to partake in. And then you've used my name that I don't like hearing. So there you go. My wife uh, has PDA, which is uh, <laughs> not a public display of affection. No, but very much not because I don't like that either. No. What is it then? Well, it is either pathological demand avoidance or persuasive demand for autonomy. No, I can't speak. Persuasive. Persuasive. Desire for autonomy. Is it not personal desire for autonomy? Could be that. Okay. Also, I, I, I amalgamated the two. Is there a scientific? But I don't actually have a problem really with the name of it. But scientifically, it's pathological demand avoidant. Yeah. But everybody who's pathologically demand avoidant doesn't like a demand, so they have to change the name of it to something else so that they come up with the name so then actually it's not a demand. It's, well, very... it's not just that. It's just like it, it, is. it is pretty insulting when you think about it. But really, I don't care about the name. It's fine. Yeah. Well, we're neurodivergent anyway in this household, but this isn't just for neurodivergent people because... We talk about a lot of deep, interesting stuff. Yeah. So. I mean, obviously, p parenting is the main crux of our angle, but it's also looking at the struggles of parenting and the mental health struggles and trying to juggle it all trying to actually have a life which is kind of the topic of this episode you'll have probably will have probably put it as a title above the um, video you see now or below wherever it goes but the um, the main crux of the crux of this episode in particular is about the rat race and trying to maybe live not not necessarily off grid but um, maybe making a choice that's right for you as a job would you yeah. say that's right yeah, it's about dreams and chasing dreams and how kind of our story, I feel like, highlights the differences in the choices you might have made growing up, opportunities that might have come along and um, then the choices you can make subsequently after meeting somebody who facilitates that, which is, is a yeah. wonderful story. I guess the best um, place to start then is actually in the beginning, isn't it? As a child, like, you know, what your parents say to you has a massive impact on the choices you make, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think I came from parents who were kind of, had stable jobs, firefighter, nurse, and that was to them what you did. You know, that's kind of just what you did. You got a solid job that paid really well, that you weren't going to get sacked from um, or made redundant from. And that was kind of what was shown to me as a child. I always felt really... I knew that wasn't for me. I know I knew I just was not that person. So but it was a real struggle to try to continually be be fed into that. Not that they were forcing me into it, but I mean just I felt like as a child I had to conform. So that really shaped my path, I think. And then yeah, subsequent relationships where that path was also guided to. I guess we'll get sense, we'll get to but... that a little bit more but so when you were a child did, what was your dream I was gonna be a famous artist that was just what I was gonna be and how old were you when you like sort of first had that dream oh I don't know I just always painted I was made stuff um because yeah, sometimes your parents go it. oh you could be this and you go oh yeah I want to be that and then that becomes your dream so can you remember the point you sort of went I want to just do this forever no it was being it was a ballerina first actually I was going to be a ballerina all the way up until my spine grew in a, the wrong way <laughs> okay so do you want to just tell <laughs> so that, talk that a little bit gone. about that I was really into my ballet and then I they discovered I had scoliosis which is where your spine grows in a curve so I had to have that correct, corrected. Um, you had to wear a back brace for a while, a back brace it? for a long time. So yeah, that kind of put put the kibosh on that, which was fine because actually I'd always been an artist. I'd always loved painting. So just to, to ask you another, just to jump in there before you kind of go on to the next step, like what were your parents like about the ballet? Um, again, it was never a job. 
it was never just something that you do as a job so then I didn't really see it as that 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 kind of ended for me probably high school time when I realized I wasn't going to be sent to ballet school (laughs) much to my dismay and I wasn't good enough so I don't know you know they probably didn't encourage it because they knew I wasn't good enough which again is fine um is it, but, mm, because you, there's, but there's other things i could have been encouraged to do what it may be in dance in the dance world mm. or whatever but then the scoliosis has happened and it's all just it that's all okay then the art came into it because that was the other thing that was my strength that i was really good at so yeah they were really encouraging i did that in college i did that for uni and that was what i was going to do so was there ever a point though where your parents sort of said i mean come on Painting pictures ain't gonna pay bills. Obviously, your parents weren't from uh, the northwest, but <laughs> yeah, well, they they were always a bit like that. Like, oh, you can you can do art and maybe have a stable job, or yeah, they didn't really grill me about it. Once I decided to do it at uni, they were very much kind of okay, go do it, go do it, and just we're gonna let me learn those life lessons on my own, which is great. Yeah, but did you did you feel like they believed in your dream yeah I did because I I just felt like I could do what I wanted at uni and that they were supportive of that there wasn't really many conversations about it after that okay that's fair enough so they were sort of they're behind you but didn't necessarily start you know driving the ship for you it was very much a kind of like you can do it but it's up to you to kind of they're just they're not particularly animated people no that's true so yeah that that was fine. I don't. I don't know why we're talking about this. Why are we talking about this? I don't know. Just to find out why, because obviously. Oh, we're talking about chasing the dream. Yeah. <laughs> it's the oh episode. God. It's what we're talking about. It's the the whole. Uh, uh, I yeah, just realised it became a bit of a therapy session. So maybe I should just. I was just asking you because I was curious because like for me, obviously, football was my thing, and you were going to be a footballer. Well, yeah, I was and I wasn't. Like my mum and dad were like very early on you can be whatever you want to be. Because my mom, unfortunately, was never ever afforded the choice. And it was kind of like her mom died. Unfortunately, when her mom was 40, she died. And my mom was 16. Um, And my mom had to then, her dad wasn't necessarily the most, especially that generation ago, that was like 1970, I think it was. So my mom had to look after her uncle, uh, her brother, my uncle, and my dad could have made it as a footballer, but earned more money doing another job. And his mum and dad needed him to bring more money into the house for the household to be able to exist. Coming from Blackpool, you know, they had quite a poor background and oh, I had quite a poor background. So um, it was very different. My parents were kind of like, go, chase your dream, mother... You know, and it was like a very different sort of approach to things. So it was like, if it wasn't football, they were like, you could be a barrister. And I was like, at that point, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll be a barrister. Because that's obviously, the, my mum and dad had just been like, you be whatever you want to be. Because your main skill was talking. Talking utter nonsense a lot of the time. But, you know, like, my mum and dad kind of had this thing of just, because they felt held back. Whereas I don't think your mum and dad ever felt that being held no, back nature. No, no. It was just this generational level of get a good job and everyone accepted it. Yeah, so I think your mum and dad were kind of like, not not as encouraging because they'd not had any hurdles to get over to where they were. Whereas my mum and dad persistently told me, we won't put any hurdles up, we won't put any hurdles up. But what's interesting is after I kind of got released by the professional football club, just before I signed professional form, so I was in what's now the academy for five years or whatever, there was very little encouragement for me to carry on. Mm. And it's, you know, in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, they were like, this dream, chase a dream, chase a dream. But like, I was encouraged to go on, well, I was asked to go on trial for another team called Tramir Rovers. And I sort of was like, oh, it's a long way. And, and because I showed doubts, they were like, well, maybe it's not the right thing to do. Then, Because obviously it would have been a massive commitment for them to drive me an, an hour and off to train in it twice a week and into games because it was a bit of a distance from Blackpool. So then that dream stopped and I look back and I'm like oh I wish they'd pushed me a bit harder but I wasn't able to push myself and what's interesting is I think all of this all of these dreams I believe you need to have parents that are encouraging but not too pushy and that's really really hard but so you know that childhood dream I think to follow that through it almost needs to be the parents give up their life to 
push you down that alleyway sometimes with the the big massive colossal dreams do you know what i mean yeah whereas they obviously felt like they were just kind of supporting you and your decisions Mm. at the time but i actually i disagree a little bit with that because we do disagree on the whole pushy parent levels i think don't we oh yeah i mean i would be more pushy you would be less pushy. yeah yeah that's for sure because i actually think pushy i don't like the word i mean when my parents i say when my parents encouraged me oh my god there was no better feeling yeah, yeah, encouragement and telling your children that they can be what they want, do what they want, they can achieve anything, not putting any limitations on them is one thing, but then pushing them into a certain thing is completely another thing for me. And I think actually... But Paul and Zabel? Because they didn't push you to go to that other club, right? And you didn't become a professional footballer, but maybe that was just meant to be for you. Yeah, but maybe, maybe. But I don't know because I didn't, because once I'd stopped, I mean, I I became a referee. I didn't even play for like a, I didn't even go and play with my mates. Like I just sacked football off altogether for years. And like that wasn't the right choice for me. But now obviously I know that I'm neurodivergent. In hindsight, obviously I wish my parents had known that because I think they'd have been better at being able to encourage me in the right way. So obviously this is a video for another day, but I think actually- You obviously needed additional support I needed, with it. Yeah, yeah, because they perceived me to be so intelligent and mature. That sounds really arrogant, but that's how kind of my neurodivergency came out was it was like, oh, he knows everything, knows all this sort of stuff. But actually I wasn't the most academic. I just knew lots of weird stuff because I had a special interest Useless in that. Useless information. Yeah. So um, my parents, I think, encouraged me to an extent more than anything. However, just going on to what I do now, which is making films and hence why we sort of in this environment. When I told my parents I was going to apply to go to drama school. Sorry. It was, they were amazing. And I realized that maybe they kind of felt bad that they had gone through a few years of not encouraging me. You know, that they could have maybe been a bit more supportive with the football, but I was very kind of, no, 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 no. So obviously it was a thing for them. And obviously when I then was like, oh, I'm gonna be an actor, which is mental for a chav from South Shore in Blackpool. Um, they were so encouraging that I, when I said it to them, I didn't even really believe it. It was a teacher at drama, at, at sixth form that had said, oh, maybe you should do this. And I went home and said it almost with a kind of tongue in cheek thinking they'd be like, oh, you know, that's a bit mad. And they were both so supportive of it that actually made me have that belief in me again. And that's the thing almost I'm saying about finding that right balance between being pushy and encouraging because, you know, that belief that my parents had in me to achieve something that seemed a little bit far out is the only reason I did it. It's the only reason I tried. And without that belief, because they didn't have that little bit of belief necessarily in the football thing, I just gave it up and went as far away from it as possible so again I know that's also probably a neurodivergent trait or whatever but I think having it doesn't even necessarily have to be your parents but having someone that believes in you is everything yes which actually very smoothly brings us to the next part of the story I think in that meeting you so I had chosen a different path and I'd got a stable job and I Why did you get a stable job? Got married and had children because that's what I was brought up to do. That's what I believed was the path that we do. That was ingrained in me growing up and that is just, you know, the norm for a lot of people. You you search for a job that pays well, that you don't mind, that, you know, affords you a certain life. You have children, you get, you get married, you have children. It's just kind of the way of things and I fell into that and that's kind of just how my life went for the next sort of 10 years and then... It didn't, um, divorce, all those things. Um, and then I met you and you had had very, a very, very, very different experience of early adulthood, I think, to me. And you'd chosen a completely different path. You'd chosen to chase the dream. Getting that kind of stable job and being in that environment wasn't necessarily ingrained in you in the same way. So you chose to just be like, oh, I'm going to be a filmmaker. You can tell that part of the story. But um yeah, so I met you and you kind of tried to discover in me what I was. I remember I remember when we met, you kind of look at me and go, yeah, but what what is it that you do? What did you enjoy? What What is your thing? And I was like, oh, well, I'm an artist. I like, I trained as an artist, but, you know, I don't like do that anymore. I haven't got time. I dismissed it massively, didn't I? Mm-hmm. 
and then we were dating and it was on you were first, you were just being so cute and we were walking down a high street that's you rare by the way disappeared into a shop and you came out with a sketchbook and a pack of pencils and I, I think I cried I might have cried I mean I cry all the time so I mean it's it's okay to cry but it was very rare for me at the time um yeah and I was just so overwhelmed as I felt believe I, I, I don't know I felt so all these profound things because it connected with me so deeply in terms of being you know a, in, in childhood and having a childhood dream it was really overwhelming and it, it, it just started from there didn't it I started sketching I started painting again after such a long period of time that's one of your paintings yeah and it just really snowballed from there. And then I realized I did have dreams and I did find joy in all of these, these things other than being a mum. And I was a single mum at the time. And I think I just was so lost in providing for them, making sure I was a good mum. You know, there's, there's so much that goes into being a single mum, my God. Being a single parent and chasing the dream, those two things are... Any, any single parent that manages to do that, I'd like to think is probably because they've got a lot of extra support from mm. other places because without that support, even when we were together trying to do the parenting and chase the dream, it's not, it's really hard. And maybe that's something we'll talk about later on, but you know, it, it, to, to chase the dream, you almost need a um, recipe that, uh, or the ingredients for the recipe. Even then it doesn't necessarily, the cake doesn't necessarily rise, you know, but I think for you, when I met you, you were just a working mom working single mom that's what you did yeah you and know. that is what I had to do to survive and I worked for an amazing company I still do work for them for minimal hours a week but they were so incredibly supported supportive and actually facilitated me being a single mom to children with quite complex needs um so they were incredible and so there's nothing wrong with being in the rat race and there's nothing wrong with having that stable job unless you have a creative mind and I think that's where the problems start they definitely did for me mm. and you saw that I was a creative person not doing a creative job and you kind of really encouraged me to open that door again and to really kind of try to find a balance between those things and because of course we've all got mortgages to pay we've got kids to pay for you have to earn money and it's difficult earning money as a creative person really tricky yeah really I've, hard to find that balance i've just had two very juxtaposing years where i did amazing and you know mostly paid for us to go to florida and have the best holiday ever followed by a barren spell um, <laughs> which is probably the best way of putting it but typically whilst being in america i missed two jobs which were then done by other people with regular clients that then reduced my work load massively because other people were then doing a cheaper version of what I do. So it was very frustrating, but that is the nature of being, you know, a creative who's freelance, you know, and you think, oh, I've earned this money. I'm not being paid for two weeks while I go on holiday, but also I'm losing jobs that I then can't come back to. So that's quite complex. So, you know, even with Chasing the Dream, the balance is very not always hard. the dream in no. reality is it no with a lot of the jobs i do are not dream jobs are they they no. are very kind of soulless a lot of them but equally i am very grateful when i work you know like last week I had a really hard week at work this week we're taking it a little bit easier and working less because it's you know and that is a privilege and i'm very very grateful but mine kind of came out of well i just didn't really have much choice because working a pro I couldn't do a proper job I didn't last in a proper job I don't get on with people for very long if they're not my people really like this is the thing I just and sadly now I know I've got ADHD I, I speak my mind so if someone's a bit of a bell end, unfortunately I might tell them in a really inopportune moment and get in trouble or, or the sack or I walk or whatever so I've never actually been sacked. <laughs> I've always walked just before I was just pushed. Just in time. But, um, you know. The difference between a, a highly masked female mm. and a low masking male autist. Yeah. But we were talking about them. I mean, we'll talk about masking on a, in another video on another day. But this is the thing is that actually for me, I'd spent a lot of my life masking to fit in um, and failing. Sadly. Yeah, but that's what I mean. I was failing. So I was putting all this effort into mask to fit in and then still not fitting in anyway. So <laughs> at least you managed to do that. But I do think 
as a parent, you know, we've gone on a very interesting journey, which again, another episode, I keep just referencing future episodes. There's just so much context or everything that we're saying. It doesn't feel like we're doing it any justice, but but we can only tell one story at a time. And I think this creative one was really important because actually as parents, the thing that gives us life and soul back into us as as human beings, that's what I'm realizing. And I think that's what you saw in me. You saw this kind of shell of a person who was functioning. I was actually bossing it as a single mum pretty much. You were, but again, you had support. I did have a little nice village around me supporting me and helping me with the kids, so that was amazing. And then we moved Um, 50 miles away and lost the support. So I was bossing it as a single mum, but I had no creative outlet. I had no soul left for me, did I? And I I was not like connected to myself as a human being and I was not finding that joy and elation and pleasure as a creative person. And that's what it brings to me. And that's why I do it because I reduced my hours in the rat race and the nine to five to ultimately then be a creative. And it was 100% the right decision as much as it also brings difficulties because I've reduced my hours at work, which means I get paid less. So then when I get paid less. It's fun. But then you get these moments where you're just like, this is what life is about. This is why I'm alive. And I didn't have any of those moments, apart from being a mum, which of course gives you many of those moments. But for yourself as a human, as an adult, you know, that that is why we're alive because we have to push the limits of ourselves. We have to feel excited. We have to feel nervous. We have to feel sick with nerves, you know, like going into audition. Mark helped me find being an actress, which is just incredible. I was this introverted, highly masked person when you met me, wasn't I? I can't, if, you, if you'd have said to me, anyway, sorry. if you had said to me, Oh my god, that actually makes I feel like I could cry about it. When we when we met, like if you said to me, in six years you're gonna be an actress who in actually enjoys making a fool of herself in front of other people and laughs at it or screaming, I did a horror film where I was being hatcheted to death. Like I can I genuinely cannot. I would have I would have just said that you are crazy you're insane there's no way I could do that and it's the most joy I've found as a creative person also if I had if you'd have said to me you'd be making paintings again that people have in their houses the people have bought the people have bought I just can't I can't even process it it's that big it's that monumental and it is it is a reason to be alive and it's which sounds really wanky but it's just not. I, no, I, feel, I do feel really emotional about it. On billboards in Korea, like or in in shop fronts in Korea, from that brand you work with, you've been shooting horror films, you've been painting pictures, you've been having a whole new lease of life because you made a choice. It's yeah, yeah. I I know I encouraged you and so on and so forth. You did. You are the reason for it, absolutely, well, and that's why we make that love. choice. And actually, so many people don't make that choice. And I guarantee you now, ninety percent of the people are watching this going, "I can't do that. I can't do that." And and to be fair, I'm not going to sit here you and lecture can. you. Well, you I'm, can. I am going to. I'm going to say that because you can. Yeah, but they you, they have to find their thing first, and that's what I was going to say is, you can't until you know where you're going. And I think. Look deep, like for you, I asked you a question that made you look inside yourself. And I don't think anyone had asked you the right questions. So we're asking you now, like, look inside yourself. Like, what is it that you genuinely love doing? Do you love trains? Do you love gardens? Like, just think to yourself, right, I love this. Okay. And then write a list of 10, well, actually try and write a list of 20, but a list of at least 10 things of how to get to that place. So if you want to be a train driver, it's like, right, Google how to be a train driver, number one. Research, you know, do all of the things. Make a list of all the things you need to do to be a train driver, to be a um, gardener or a landscape gardener, whatever it is that is your dream. Make a list of the things that do it and just take your time and make those steps and go for it. And it isn't about just going and quitting your job tomorrow because that actually is a little bit nuts because then you've got no stability. And without stability, chasing the dream is also impossible. I've I will tell you a bit about my dream in a second, but that's a key thing to remember is that stability, which is what we are now rebuilding our dream upon because we are now stable as a couple, as a family, as a relationship, as a human being. You know, I've had several breakdowns 
several unfortunately whilst trying to chase the dream because I was unstable my mum died when I was 19 and then unfortunately I immediately then started ch trying to chase the dream from a very unstable place in my 20s I made some very big mistakes that got me in a lot of trouble and I had some serious 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 mental health issues that could have ended horrendously if I'd not you know actually sought help and that's not necessarily professional help but just from friends mm -hmm. and people that matter on social media randomly I got so much help that got me through a difficult time but with stability you can achieve so much and sometimes it's about like what Claire's done reduce the load a little bit it's not about necessarily going and go fuck you I hate the rat race you all you know yes try and get away from it as fast as you can but that doesn't mean going at it hell for leather, gung-ho, putting yourself in a really tricky position where you're unstable and you end up having a breakdown like this guy. I think what you said about finding it first in terms of that connection, I think there's a real childhood connection that mm. has to be. How did you find joy as a child? We, yeah, we've some talked people, about this recently. I do agree, but there's some people don't discover what they want to do until they've seen it and some people don't see those things until later in life. But I no, get but what you mean. Finding what you enjoy it doing. It might be like an engineering technique type thing that you love building as a kid okay so is there something in that world or sport okay is there something in that world so it is yeah it might like, not be the exact yeah. thing but it gives you an idea exactly as yeah. to what your kind of your soul loves to do and yeah. what you're drawn towards yeah and for me i trained as an actor i went to drama school was an actor darling for whatever reason that didn't quite work out immediately so myself and another chap got a, another chap John, go on, i'm dropping <laughs> chaps everywhere another chap in the house um yeah no, so you made it work well i don't care <laughs> they're gonna get have to get used to my stupid impressions anyway i um didn't quite make it as an actor but decided to start filming stuff and found a real joy in the process of making films because i also liked drawing as a kid but i was mainly a sports sporty but aside from that i was very creative and but i wasn't necessarily the most practical person but i was a technical person so you know, like my, my brother's like a mechanic and an engineer, but I'm more of a computer whiz tech camera dude. Go on. I was just going to say the connection to performing, though, I think is your, it all goes back to that. Oh, yeah, of course. As a child, you were like the class clown making people laugh. You're very vocal, you know, it just loud. It's all actor, isn't it? It all shouts and screams actor yeah but i'm a little bit too big for the screen unfortunately but as you not can see. for the stage no but i i mean that's another thing theater takes up the rest of your life so being a parent and being in theater is would be really tricky you'd have yeah. to just have me at home looking after the yeah. kids <laughs> so this is the thing like oh, as, as much as we're sitting here now saying um oh do this do that like it's about balance and it's about stability and it's about drive and it's about you know like for us right now instead of doing something else that we should be doing that we need to you deep know, cleaning and tidying yeah. and redecorating the house we're, we're doing this but because we choose to not yeah do that. but we've got the facilities to and we've got the access to and it's like you've got the drive you know there's a saying that if you if you spend 20 minutes a day on something for an entire year you'll be in the top five percent in the world at that thing because you could also do that whilst holding down a full-time job of course technically. like you might have to do those things alongside which i had to for a mm -hmm. long time didn't i before i then let's think i bought you a sketchbook to do it. and then i got you an easel and then uh, i put you in one of my things it's a slow process you know yeah. sometimes even at our age you just have to take things bit by bit it's not about going like a snail pace but some things just take time so it's about having a rational approach to it and also taking the pressure off yourself for it to be a career or something that makes your money you know that is absolutely not what I started doing when I was sort of sketching again or when I was painting it's absolutely nothing to do with it being productive and I think that's really important in that what you do for joy and for pleasure and to feed your soul it is not about the you know capitalist ideal of earning money from it it's not about that. I don't know. It's hard it's because not. you know. You no, no I appreciate that. that I appreciate that. Or it's and you're not authentic. I disagree because, like, I think a lot of it is a means to an end. So you know that the end goal will be ideally earning a living, or it's not about being rich, but earning a living to tick over. So it's about spending time in the early stage like right like this now we don't care if anybody watches it right mm. we're doing it because we enjoy doing we it we find joy it's a creative, doing it. it's a creative outlet and you know but this 
will lead to us having a conversation with someone else and then someone someone goes, oh, what do you do? And, and it's about planting seeds. You don't know which one's going to grow into a sunflower, which one's going to grow into a weed, but you've got to keep planting those seeds knowing that eventually it will flower. And actually that is the chasing the dream. I think it can be a hobby, but if it's a dream, you do have to understand that there is a, an end result that ideally will be a flourishing of something. Yeah, yeah, I do see what you mean. You know what but I, mean? I just think the the day-to-day -day practice of it has to come really authentically from the, the beginning. Joy. Yeah, the beginning, of course. And that's the point I'm making about taking it step by step. Like if you do it for 20 minutes a day for a year, you're going to be good at it by the end of that year. So then you set your new list of 10 things. You're right, how do I get to the next stage? So I know that I need to do these 10 things to become x y and z right now i've got to this stage after one year how can i get to stage two and you know yeah, i guess about... that's the entrepreneurial side of it which, yeah and unfortunately as a creative, i'm just not no i get that. that i get that but that's why we're here to kind of try and help with that i've been doing it now for 20 years how have i managed to do this for 20 years like god that's emotional as well like i, I feel very proud such because, an you know, achievement yeah my mum's dream for me was to move to london and chase the dream and i haven't necessarily become famous or rich or whatever but i've got a family that means the world to me and i do what i love so like that in itself is the dream you know and that's yeah, the point absolutely. but it took a lot of instability and failures and misery because i didn't know the right approach and the right approach is to have sometimes something to fall back on initially so that you can then grow and it's about growing it's you know everything in life is about growing you know but grow too fast and you'll end up with stretch marks. Sorry, that was a, in, you know, it was just, it's one of those things, isn't it? You have to do everything with moderation and slowly but surely. And yeah, sorry, I, I can't, <laughs> this is the way my brain works, man. It's mental. Welcome to my brain. Um, so yeah, no, but the point is, is if you take it step by step and believe, you know, all of these wanky videos online, they're not all wanky, but when they're like, go do this now, take that, 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 it can be like, oh my God, yeah, all right, I will, I'm going to go. And it's like, just take it, just take it, bit of a deep breath first and just think because that's what i struggle to do <laughs> breathe isn't it i'm not really good at breathing yeah and i will You're all about the reaction aren't yeah you? and that's the thing so i have to listen to my own advice here because <laughs> it's that's what i failed to do like you know maybe that's why i'm not rich because i've kept i've lost a lot of clients from saying what i think yeah, but i think that comes back to to being authentic, authentic. and just doing what's that face <laughs> Out of me. I'm not taking the piss out of you. I'm, I'm not taking the piss out of you. I'm almost being what a lot of the audience are probably thinking. Like it's quite wanky a lot of what we're saying, and it's it's it, yeah, you've got to get on board it with it. And but also, not, but also take the piss out of it. it. No, but that's what I mean. You've yeah. almost got to be like, look how wanky we are. What a pair of bellends. But equally going yeah but right now we are happier than we've been for a long long time because we're making we feel the really, right really really choices and grateful and we are really privileged in that because we get we are doing what we love a lot of the time but i just think if you're if you're if it if your productivity is coming from an authentic joyful place you know like all of the acts and opportunities that I've had, modern opportunities that I've had it's been because i genuinely found that joy in the process so i love i've found joy in doing self tapes now i've found a joy in role playing and being silly with the and it's it's seeped into my everyday life and changed me as a human being and really helped me with the whole unmasking process just tapping into that almost quite childlike joy and silliness that i just i genuinely didn't think i had in me and i thought it had disappeared and that I was just a grown up and with all these responsibilities. And as much as I am that, why can't you find, like we're just here, aren't we? We're here on this, we're like little ants in the universe, just wandering around on this planet. And if we can't find joy whilst we're here and we can't find experiences that keep us feeling alive, then what is the point? But what I think is that's, the actual point? That's actually then been the catalyst for you to, you know, to open up all of your emotions and like go on this journey of self-discovery of kind of like trying to deal with trauma, which, you know, I, because I'd had a few more mistakes before you and had a few more massive traumatic moments in my life that I brought upon myself, I had to kind of look a bit deeper, a bit earlier. Yeah. yeah. So when I met you, I was sort of already 
not actually committed to, but on the path of, ah, I'm a bit wacky. I need to kind of probably address that at some point. <laughs> yeah. And you were aware of it and you actually had a lot of, by proxy, you'd learned a lot of techniques to sort of get yourself by. I think. Yeah, but that's, what I, again, the same thing. I just got myself to a point of, oh, okay, if I do this, I can survive. Or if I do this, then, you know, I won't think too negatively about everything. But even still, after I met you, I still had a big breakdown when we split mm. up and, you know, we'd had, we had a quite a big breakup, probably eight months into it maybe something like that yeah, yeah. i had to really refine myself and actually the if you want the truth it only took that text i basically we we unfortunately had split up and we got back together and we split up and got back together and split up we were one of those yo-yo relationships but then claire sent me a text message with a picture of a pregnancy test <laughs> so that was fun to receive <laughs> Especially when it said that she was pregnant. Uh, but within two seconds, my whole approach had changed. That then changed everything in my life. And I then went on this journey of self-discovery. And again, it's been very, very rocky for, for the last, our daughter turned four last week. And you know- <gasps> she's, a, she's a baby in the first video you yeah, did. Yeah, <gasps> yeah. So actually, no, it must be four years ago then since we did it. Yeah. So it was lockdown, like, wasn't it? Almost them, four years. She was nine weeks. Yeah, so almost four years. Basically, from that point on, unfortunately, as much as I went on a self-discovery and started to change and get better, my dream just went boop and just went out the window because sometimes other things have to come first. And actually... yeah. The and that's like you were saying, the dream has to come from kind of a place of stability, really, mm. and knowing yourself and, and being ready to yeah. do it. Yeah. And you might be in a situation where you've got a wife that's just like, oh, and you've got loads of money in the bank and your wife's like, just go and pursue your dream. Or your husband's like, I'll stay at home and be a house husband. But that's <laughs> the, the likelihood your of that. Your gay husband. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I can be whatever you want me to be, darling. So <laughs> all I would say is it's about doing what's right for you, but also do what's right for you. Don't be just, you know, in this rat race, killing yourself because you know, like we've speak, speaking about our parents, Claire lost her dad at a young age. I lost my mom at a young age. And my mom, bless her, like she worked full time. We were talking about this earlier mm. today. She worked full time. My dad worked full time. My mom did all the cooking, the cleaning, the shopping, the washing, the ironing. Like my mom did everything. My dad still worked hard. I'm not denying that. And my dad, you know, used to take me to football and things like that. But my mom worked herself into an early grave. There's no two ways about it. She got cancer and she just, she would even say to me, like, I've worried myself into this place and, trying to survive and she encouraged me to not do that and I'm not saying necessarily that I'm not going to go into an early grave because I'm worrying myself with other things <laughs> however you know it won't there be because, lessons to be learned yeah it there, won't because absolutely. I've not chased the dream and I will chase the dream whether I achieve the the full potential of my goals is another story but I will always pursue them till the day I die mm. and I want our kids to know that that's you know, you never give up. You just never give up. Yeah, and I think actually what you've touched on there about the kids is that I wanted them to see me doing what I love. That was a, a huge motivator because I, especially we'd had arty, hadn't we? And I started painting and I started doing yoga and I started just trying to find these things for me, little pockets within the day that were for myself. And I don't think my eldest two had ever seen me do that. They'd just seen me look after them or go to work, look after them or go to work. And that that isn't a good thing to be teaching them. And so I realized when I saw Artie, our youngest, you know, want to paint with me, want to do yoga with me. I've got loads of videos of her wanting to do that. The other two joining in, I just thought, oh my God. Yeah, this is, so, this is too important for me to not do it in front of them it's too important to not show them that you you and your own experience of life and finding joy every day doing something that you love doing mm. is just I, I can't I can't live like that anymore so it was they were a huge part of it too and now I, I do think that well even William said to me the other day he he finds a lot of pride in that he tells his friends and you know he he's we've opened our children's eyes we've given them a new perspective we've changed their perspective and they see us doing crazy creative things now which i love exactly you couldn't have put it better myself i mean i just want my kids to see us doing this and be like oh wow well, i want well they do i mean we're doing some more recordings later with some reviews uh check out the richardson's reviews we do stuff with the kids they see this as a wonderful thing to do they all love painting and drawing and 
you know singing and dancing and yeah they find um so I'm now the biggest advocate for drama therapy even though I haven't been through it myself but I've learned so much from you and what you went through at drama school and then since kind of acting myself it is life-changing for, it has been for me but look at Artie when she the amount of um, scenarios she acts out you know like she's playing things out with her toys like kids naturally therapeutically uh, therapeuticize that's not a word but they give themselves therapy by role playing and kind of playing things out and it helps them to understand things. Their development is actually hinged on play. Like yeah, they know that now. It's, so it's almost like we're all as human beings we are just actors. We find characters within ourselves that we that's perform. That's a very neurodivergent thing though, isn't it? Every the day. Mask, that's, you, that's what you do. <laughs> that's just me. Yeah, and I try to do that and I'm terrible at playing <laughs> anything other than myself, unfortunately. Yeah, but you know, we've acted till the uh, since the start of time as humans. Of course, yeah. But we've evolved a little bit. I don't know. I'm not a therapist. I don't know the correct things, but um, this has probably gone on a bit of a tangent anyway. So... Um, yeah, maybe we should wrap this one up. I think this has been a good first episode back in the chair. Yes. Yeah. What is that? I don't know. I, 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 I should, be, should be. Okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. That was better. Um, so, well, thank you for watching. If you've lasted this long, then every credit to you. And um, we'll be back with another episode next week or the week after. Are we, are we doing it fortnightly? We don't what? know. Let's not make promises. Well, no. Yeah, it might be in four years' it, time. Bye-bye. <laughs> God, what we're we gonna look like in four years' time. No. Anyway, it's been um, a, I've I've enjoyed it, babe. It's been fun, babe. Yeah, That's let's do point. it again. That sounded we sounded like a right pair of twats there. We are trapped. Well, okay, there we go. Fair <laughs> enough. I'll take that. Um, yeah. So until next time, I've been Love Marcus. You, bye. Bye. Peace out. Love you. Bye. Bye.